Okay, so we're going to continue with electrolyte balances. So what are electrolytes? Electrolytes are really ions. They are charged particles. And they are found in substances that are held together by ionic bonds. And those substances are called acids if the cation, the positive ion, is hydrogen ions. They're called bases if the anion is OH, uh, which is called hydroxyl, um, and salts if the neither cation or anion fall into that. So the big thing about, um, about these is that when put in water, the anything with an ionic bond will either associate, stick together, or dissociate. And when they dissociate, they free up these positive and negatively charged ions, which are called electrolytes because they have this charge. So what do the salts do? They, because it's mostly salt that we're gonna worry about at this point, they regulate osmosis. Because they produce so many particles, and because they're electrically charged, they don't cross uh, the nonpolar cellular membranes, and so therefore, not easily, they have to be facilitated across. Um, so they um, cause osmosis. They are also electrically um, charged, so they could, they store energy as potential energy. Uh, so they are excitable. They regulate membrane permeability and how things are secreted as well. Now sodium is the most important one because it's the most abundant, uh, especially in the extracellular fluid. Uh, so of the 300 milliosmoles uh, osmolarity in the extracellular fluid, 280 of it comes from sodium. Sodium is it. Everything else is just other. Sodium is easy to move around. When sodium goes into the cell, it leaks into the cell through um, whatever gate it can get through. And so that is facilitated diffusion. And it's pumped out using it, the, the sodium potassium pump, which is an ATPase pump. It's active transport, it's primary active transport. Um, so one of the things that's interesting is that the amount of sodium that you have in you may change, but the concentration remains stable because of osmosis. So if sodium content goes up, then water content and water retention goes up to keep the concentration the same. If sodium content goes down, then things desiccate and there's less water, so concentration of sodium stays the same. The concentration of sodium is critical to um, homeostasis. Not the amount of sodium, the concentration of sodium. So changes in sodium levels will affect the amount of fluid that's in the extracellular compartment and therefore plasma. So more plasma volume, more blood volume, which means more blood pressure. Um, so the, um, so a lot of this is controlled by the kidneys, right? Uh, there's, for something that's so important, there's no receptors for sodium, but rather there are receptors that monitor the effects of sodium, mainly blood pressure and blood volume because sodium controls this balance so closely. It's the main thing. So there's a hormone that, that is involved and it's called aldosterone. Aldosterone is made by the adrenal gland. And what it does is it turns on the, um, 
the sodium potassium pumps in the distal convoluted tubules of the nephron and the collecting ducts. So no aldosterone, most of the sodium is reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubules, 25% more in the loop of Henle, and any extra from that, like the last 10%, is in the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct. But the reabsorption of that is dependent on aldosterone. Aldosterone is present, you actively reabsorb using the sodium potassium pump. Aldosterone is not present, those sodium potassium pumps don't turn on and you don't reabsorb it. Now water reabsorption follows uh, that if antidiuretic hormone is present. If there's no antidiuretic hormone, then we pump the sodium, but water can't follow it because water can't get through the membrane. So aldosterone is really controlled by the kidneys. Brandon angiotensin is the main trigger for aldosterone release. So there are cells within the kidney, the juxtaglomerular apparatus, and it secretes renin when the, you either have the sympathetic nervous system firing, so flight or fight, or when osmolarity of the filtrate is gone down, or too much blood pressure, so, uh, or not enough blood pressure, so the stretch goes down. So, that causes renin to cause the enzyotensin, then causes the release of aldosterone, which then increases the amount of sodium that is brought back, which increases osmolarity, which brings mean, increases the amount of blood and raises blood pressure. It uh, increases the osmolality of the filtrate, and um, that extra blood pressure is useful in fight and flight. Aldosterone can also be triggered by elevated potassium levels. But it takes a while for all this to happen. So there, there you go. It's so increased potassium or decreased sodium in the blood, or the renin stimulates the adrenal cortex to release aldosterone, which causes the kidney tubules to increase sodium reabsorption and increase potassium secretion, because it's the sodium potassium pump, which changes the plasma levels of sodium and potassium, which then negatively feed back to the adrenal cortex. So that's what happens when blood pressure needs to be raised. What happens if blood pressure needs to be lowered? Your heart will respond by increased blood pressure by stretching and the atria of the heart releases a protein called atrial natriuretic peptide and what atrial natriuretic peptide does atrial from the heart na, NA sodium uretic p peptide which is a protein so it's a protein from the atrium of the heart that causes sodium to be in your pee, that makes your pee salty. So uh, what it does is it decreases blood pressure. So uh, it makes you not release, so atrial natriuretic peptide makes you not release antidiuretic hormone. So you uh, pee more and have therefore less blood. It turns off the renin and aldosterone production, so you don't reabsorb as much sodium, so you have less osmosis, and so you excrete more sodium and more water. You also decrease the amount of angiotensin, so you get vasodilation. So A and P makes you pee salty. You pee more salt and water away, and therefore lowers blood pressure. There are other things, so estrogen 
increases reabsorption, like aldosterone does. So that's why you retain water during certain parts of the menstrual cycles and during pregnancy. Um, progesterone blocks the reabsorption of sodium by blocking aldosterone. Um, so estrogen works with it, progesterone works against it. Um, the glucocorticoids, so this would be um, the glucocorticoids, that's cortisol, increased sodium reabsorption. It's for stress. That's why you get high blood pressure when you're stressed. It's the baroreceptors, watch this. And so you can look at, at this chart and follow it along. Okay, potassium works pretty much the opposite of sodium because potassium is in the is high in the intracellular fluid. So, um, and what we mostly worry about is the resting membrane potential with this and uh, excitedness in neurons and muscles. Um, so. There, it works alongside with acidity, uh, and so it ends up interfering um, with the excitable cells. So potassium balance is controlled by the collecting ducts and to a lesser extent the distal convoluted tubule. So high sodium or high potassium content makes you secrete potassium out into the urine. When potassium levels are low, you reabsorb potassium. Aldosterone is the big thing. So the principal cells have the sodium potassium pump. And so you, you bring back so, sodium you secrete potassium, so the two are linked. Calcium is hugely important, and it's regulated very closely. It's involved with neuromuscular excitability, with the neurotransmitter release, blood clotting, etc. all of those things. So if you have hypocalcemia, then the outside of the excitable cell is not as positive as the inside. So you're closer to depolarization, which means you have an increased excitability and muscles will go into spasm. If you have not enough calcium, or I'm sorry, if you have too much calcium, then you have too much and you can't get to threshold of depolarization and it inhibits neurons, muscles, and heart muscles. So there's two main hormones that control it, parathyroid hormone and calcitonin. So where does this calcium go? We don't lose it, we just store it in our bones. Bones are the reservoir for it. So parathyroid hormone is released when calcium levels are low. And so what parathyroid hormone does is makes osteoclasts eat bone and shit calcium. So it starts to take away the bone to release the calcium into the blood. Kidneys reabsorb more calcium under parathyroid hormone, and the small intestine absorbs more calcium from food under parathyroid hormone. So, um, all of these things increase the amount of calcium in the blood, and that's the target of parathyroid hormone. So the parathyroid releases parathyroid hormone, which causes the osteoclasts to uh, eat bone and release calcium into the blood. We absorb more calcium in the kidneys, absorb more um, calcium from your intestines through vitamin D. All of that raises the level which inhibits parathyroid hormone release. And 
and it also affects phosphates. Now, the next slide is in here, but calcitone in puts calcium in the bone, calcitone in. So if you have too much calcium, then you get rid of it by storing it in bone, and the hormone that causes it to be deposited in bone is calcitonin, and that comes from the thyroid gland. The anions are regulated along with their cations, so we really care more about the, the, um, the cation, and then the anions just follow. Um, 